Hello, and thank you for joining National Certificates Discovering Your Pathway to Board Certification webinar. Today's hosts are myself, Donna Sarvello, and the NCBTMB Chair, Dr. Lena Gupta. Hi, Lena, how are you? Hi, Donna, I'm doing well, thanks. It's so great to be doing a webinar with you. It's great to be working with you, too. We haven't done a webinar together in a very long time. I know, and we have got some really important information to transmit in this one. Well, excellent. Let's get started. Today's agenda is the purpose of certification, why NCBTMB is retiring national certification, the creation of board certification, how to transition into board certification, what do you do after you've become board certified? And then we will answer some pre-submitted questions and then some live questions and answers. Don't forget to submit your live questions during this webinar. We want to answer all of your questions before we get off this webinar. So to get started, Lena, can you explain to us what the purpose of board certification is? Yes, I'd love to, Donna. Board certification is really all about distinguishing the entry-level certificate from the board certification itself, not only in the massage therapy profession, but also healthcare professions. There's an entry-level amount of training that then qualifies a person to take a licensing exam. With board certification, it's really a credential that allows the individual to demonstrate that they've reached a higher standard of skills and competencies. And from the point of when they first enter school to then gaining that entry-level education, their licensure, and then board certification, we are creating a career pathway, modeling that on not only the medical but other healthcare professions as well. As well as uh, with those aspects, the board certification uh, speaks the language of the medical profession. It's a model that people are very familiar with, as well as the general public. So it gives us a mechanism to increase awareness about the education of the massage therapist, the higher level board certification credential, and an opportunity to educate the public about it. So those are really some of the reasons behind making this transition to board certification. Wonderful. Now, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening to national certification? So national certification was originally born through a group of people getting together who wanted to create a standard and enable reciprocity among the states. During that time and over the 20 years or so, Donna, what really happened was the national certification exam was used by states to gain licensure, and we saw many states um, achieving that successfully. But in the process of doing that, the lines got very blurred between what is licensure and what is certification, because traditionally, licensure relates to entry level and certification and more so board certification is an advanced level credential. So in an effort to clarify uh, the difference between these two and also for us to live our mission to define an advanced standard, we introduced the BCTMB, which is the board certification in therapeutic massage and bodywork representing the higher level credential, and as I mentioned before, distinguishing it from the entry level of a new graduate. That was an excellent explanation. Now let's move even further into what is board certification doing for our profession? Well, board certification, we can really think of it in terms that we're very familiar with. For example, if we consider a regular family physician versus a person who's board certified in family medicine, 
the person who's board certified in family medicine would be more desirable as an employee because they have maintained a certain credential. It clearly demonstrates uh, their competency and willingness to continue with their education. And um, we are really modeling on that in terms of setting the standard within the massage therapy profession for board certification and creating uh, this clear pathway where we really want people to understand and everybody listening that entry level relates to the initial credential from the school and thereafter the license, whereas the board certification, just as it is in medicine, is really something that we all want to be aiming for and also maintain to really demonstrate all our hard work and wonderful skills that we um, attain over the years. Yeah, and, you know, I've been speaking to different medical professionals in hospitals, and I know that um, several hospitals are beginning to incorporate massage therapy into their program, and um, specifically board-certified massage therapists. We all know that Mayo Clinic only hires board-certified massage therapists, and I just had the opportunity to speak to a hospital in Indiana called St. Francis, and they have one of the larger massage therapy programs within their hospital, and they only accept board-certified massage therapists. In addition mm. to that, yeah, in, in addition to that, um, I've spoken to several high-end spas, and they only hire board-certified massage therapists so they can say that they hire the top therapists, and they market the fact that their therapists are board-certified. And then we have um, physical therapy clinics, um, several throughout the country who want massage therapists to work in their clinics with them, and they're only hiring board-certified massage therapists. So I think all in all, when we look at our upper um, medical and spa profession, um, they are making sure that they do hire board-certified therapists. They're looking for quality. Now, with that said, Lena, I do want to be clear that this is board certification is a higher credential. It is obtainable by all massage therapists that work towards excellence. So it's not just for people that want to work in high-end medical or high-end spa or with um, physical therapists or anything like that. Any massage therapist that is serious about excellence and serious about advancing our profession can become board certified. Yeah, I think yeah. that really shows how board certification is being received and uh, not only within our profession, but by some of these major institutions and huge corporations. I also, I'm a graduate from Duke, and I was there recently. I know that they're looking to elevate their standards in massage therapy. They're also conducting research in massage therapy. So although board certification is very new, it is also perfusing uh, throughout the, you know, the health, the wellness, as well as the corporate entities, so that we can all move forward together with the wave of advancing standards. Yes, exactly. And what better way to do it, as in every profession, as in how every medical profession has done it, to define and advance the highest standards? Through certification. Absolutely, Donna. Okay. So let's talk about transitioning into board certification now. If you are nationally certified and in good standing, you do not have to take another test, but you do have to meet the minimal requirements. And I'm sure that all of you out there listening have met the minimal requirements if you're already nationally certified. So we'll just, I'm gonna give a brief overview right now, and then we're gonna go deeper to ensure that everybody out there understands what these minimal requirements mean. So first, you need 750 hours of education total. Second, you need 250 hours of professional hands-on work experience. You need to keep a current CPR certification and pass a criminal background check. The last two things, agree to uphold NCB standards of practice and code of ethics, and then agree to oppose human trafficking. It doesn't mean you have to get involved in human trafficking or fighting it. It just means that you have to agree to oppose it. 
And then lastly, the cost to transition into board certification is one-time fee when you're transitioning. You only have to pay one time $85. You don't have to pay the transitional fee of $85 and then automatically right away pay another $85 for renewal because essentially you're renewing when you transition. And we've made that very affordable so that we can ensure all those who are eligible for board certification and everybody listening not only can gain that higher level credential, but that um, by being more affordable, cost is not an issue. So that is a, a very conscious choice and one that uh, has really enabled board certification to perfuse in all the many places that you've mentioned, Donna. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, now let's make sense of the transition requirements. So, Lena, what does currently nationally certified in good standing mean? Well, for all those listening, I would really like to clarify what this means. So, first of all, uh, those of you listening uh, need to have taken a certification test with us. And that can be the NCETM or the NCTMB. What that does is it shows that you have a proven skill set that demonstrates critical thinking and that your knowledge is proven beyond the entry level so that an employer knows that you can work with other professionals in a clinical setting or a therapeutic environment as you've gained experience in session planning as well as the soft skills that we all need uh, in professional practice. And we also, through this process, all gradually get more familiar with the necessary business skills, both working for others as well as in our own practice. So this enables us to say that those who have taken the exam represent these skills and competencies um, are in good standing. Right, right, right. And um, just to clarify, your national certification, well, if your national certification has not yet expired, you're in good standing. That means that you are, um, you can transition at any time now. If your national certification is in its lapse period, then NCBTMB will work with you to transition and to renew into board certification. Um, you would just have to call us or to email us, and we'll give you that information towards the end of the slide or towards the end of the webinar. If your national certification has, ex has completely expired, you are out of the lapse area, you have completely expired, you will be required to take the board certification examination. Now, when we talk about lapsed and expired, for national certification, we are still um, abiding by our national certification requirements. So if somebody is lapsed, the past requirements were a three-year lapse period. We will work with you over those three years. So if you just lapsed two months ago or three months ago, then we will definitely work with you even a year ago. We will still um, respect our past requirements. Thank okay. you, Donna. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, now, let's make sense of the 750 hours of education. Can you describe how the Board of Directors decided on these 750 hours? Yes, I get this question a lot, Donna, and I'm sure those who are listening who are wondering, too, um, how did this number really evolve? It's it was not really a very easy process to um, be able to come up with a number because when we look at the landscape of education in the massage therapy profession, we see, and I'm sure there are some who are listening who graduated from a 500-hour program, but I'm also sure there are those who took a 1,000 hours or more. So we have quite a diversity in terms of what was the baseline education of a massage therapist. Because this is the first time that we've moved away from the entry level credentialing of the 500 hours, we felt that 750 hours represented an amount of time that a person could gather up those hours 
and it was able to be uh, realistic. Because in this one, we're not just taking the original education. So for those listening, if you did graduate from a 500-hour program, you can also add accredited college and university courses, as well as continuing education. So like you, Donna, and like many of those listening, we've talked with so many people who already actually have 750 hours, but may not realize it because they're focusing solely on the original training. And that's something I really wanted to clarify. So there are many different ways of meeting this 750-hour requirement. Um, and um, then so, that leads us to the next part about the um, graduation. Um, so what I hear you saying, so I graduated, and I just want to give everybody out there an ex um, example. So I graduated from a school that had 630 hours of education. Um, when I transitioned into board certification, I used that 630 hours of education and then to make up that additional um, 180 hours, no, I can't count anymore, 70, 120 hours. 120 whatever. hours. Um, I used my accredited college and university courses. So it was a very simplistic process, except that I can't do math anymore. Um, so using the additional <laughs> hours from my education made up the hours that I didn't have from massage therapy school. And that's perfectly well and fine. Everybody can do that. Or if you've been a massage therapist for 20 years and you graduated from a 600-hour program, but you have 150 hours of additional education, then you can use those CEs. You can use the continuing education courses that you've taken to transition. And so it's not, yeah, it's not a difficult requirement to meet. And actually, Donna, I think that many people listening and to all of you out there, uh, my experience has been that many of you are already already have the 750 hours, but were maybe unclear as to whether the total education counts towards board board certification. And as long as it's accredited, and also. For those of you who have been nationally certified for many years, in each four-year cycle, you would have taken 48 hours of continuing education, though many people take much more. So I'm finding more and more that more people are already meeting the standard without really realizing this. So I think that's a really important point that you're raising, Donna. Right. Thank you. Um, I do want to add one last clarification in here. NCD asks for proof of graduation to ensure its records are accurate and its certificates are legitimate. We want to, because we've gone such a long time and because um, we have so much information, if you're asked to submit your education, it's not a punishment. It's just that we are ensuring that we have accurate information. So if we're ever asked, we can produce that information and we can say with up, the utmost confidence that you have met the requirements and that you are board certification material. All right. So let's move on to Lena. Can you explain where the 250 hours of professional hands-on work experience came from? That's another really frequently asked question, actually. And um, we really looked at what is it going to take for a person to gain enough experience to be able to say they have some advanced skills, they have some experience working with clients, whether it's a clinical environment or other massage therapy environment. Looking at it both from the new graduate perspective as well as a seasoned person who may be transitioning. And 250 hours of professional work experience, which typically takes a new graduate maybe six months to complete seemed to be a number that we could uh, place a line in the sand and say this is the minimum in order to be able to gain those hours of experience that can assure employers, clients, and the profession at large that we are now moving towards the board certification. 
So that was the, the background and also sufficient number to distinguish it from those who are at the entry level, um, maybe with very little clinical experience or hours. And then out of the 250 hours, we also felt that it was important to recognize many massage therapists, many people listening, as well as ourselves, do a great deal of voluntary work. So we stipulated that out of those 250 hours, a person could contribute 25 hours of their voluntary work towards their professional um, hours. Excellent. And, you know, I work with many spas and hospitals that hire massage therapists. Their main concern is um, that new therapists lack soft skills and the ability to reschedule or actually speak comfortably with clients. Working in the professional environment helps therapists learn how to reschedule and speak to these clients. Um, they are extremely valuable skills to our profession, and you can only learn these skills by working in the profession in a professional environment, not through books or school. So these hours help improve the massage therapist. And also, you know, it's a common part of training. We have to be able to show that a board-certified massage therapist really offers something more than an entry-level therapist. And all those skills that you mentioned in the clinical environment is, is, is absolutely a critical piece here. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, let's talk a little bit about CPR. Um, one of our requirements is that um, each board-certified massage therapist must carry current CPR certification. Um, accepting a CPR certification mirrors the rest of the healthcare profession. If you speak to anybody in the healthcare profession, they have to have the CPR certification in case it comes to a life or death situation and they want to get involved, they know what to do. Now, you know, working with some massage therapists, I think the CPR, um, it, it kind of brings a little bit of fear in them. I've been asked, why people have to keep CPR, and so we explain it just that way. And people say, well, I still wouldn't be comfortable um, working on somebody if a situation arose. Carrying current CPR doesn't mean that you have to jump into every life or death situation. It just means if you do, if you feel comfortable with it, then you know what you're doing. You're not going to harm the person more. So be re or rest assured that it doesn't mean that you have to save every person that you come across. Okay, with that said, NCB will accept um, CPR certifications from the American Red Cross, the American Heart Association, and the American Safety um, and Health Institute. We know that these are reputed, reputable um, organizations. You may also take courses from individuals. You know, we have CPR instructors that travel to different areas to teach CPR. And as long as they are certified by one of these organizations, we'll accept the CPR from them or from you. And then types of CPR is one of the biggest questions that we ask or that were asked. And we will accept um, BLS, heart savers, any of the CPRs that are offered within these organizations. So you don't have to take a full heart savers or full BLS if you just want to take heart savers. All right. Now, um, we do have a video that will show everybody how to transition in board certification. We didn't feel it um, necessary to take up the time during this webinar to show this video, but if you go to the address listed on this webinar, you'll be able to watch the video. It will take you through each step that you have to go through for the application process. And this will be available to you tomorrow, this webinar. So please take the time. If you want to jot down this web address, feel free to do so. Or if you want to wait until tomorrow so you can just click on the webinar, you're free to do that also. And I think I'd like to add, Donna, that that's one of those very interactive um, videos which literally shows every step what to do. So it's very well worth watching. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we have several other um, YouTube videos, and we also have videos on our website that explain different processes 
and different areas that people have questions on. So if you don't have the time to sit down and read something, if you're teaching or if you're busy, you can play it in the background and listen to it. And they, they're very educational and um, they explain everything that we do. Excellent. So let's talk now about board certification renewal. Um, Lena, can you explain the board of directors' direction when they came um, when they decided on the board certification renewal requirements? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would like to talk about renewal, but just before I do that, I want to revisit a little bit in terms of when I was emphasizing um, how to put together the 750 hours of education. Um, I know a lot of people uh, listening are, um, have graduated from the 500-hour school and are probably really wondering, uh, even if they meet the 250 hours, gosh, how do I really find all those documents from, in some cases, 20 years ago if you were nationally certified such a long time ago like many of us were. So if you nationally certified quite some time ago, then we already know that you did 48 hours of continuing education in each cycle. If you have a college credits or university credits, you would be able to get a transcript from those colleges. So we will work with you very directly in being able to put the 750 uh, hours together. So I want, I want to reassure everybody listening that uh, if you can give us uh, whatever information you can provide, we can put it together to meet that requirement. Because a lot of times um, I notice people can be very anxious about that. And it's really a much easier process than perhaps it sounds over the webinar. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, um, so everybody out there knows, and so they can discuss this with their peers also. Um, like Lena said, people get anxious out there when they don't understand something. Just call us. Just email us. We're not going to let anything happen to you. So you, <laughs> if something happens and there's a day that goes by, don't worry. We're going to get back to you. Well, that's very reassuring, Donna, but I think probably one of the the, the biggest questions is really, uh, you know, when you and I have been at the booth and at different events, which has been about, oh, my goodness, how do I piece together all these pieces of paper from the past? Because many people just keep their, their current information in their current cycle. So mm -hmm. um, I think that both you and the staff do an excellent job of enabling people to put it together. And often, even when I've looked at people's transcripts, you quite easily see that there are far more hours than the 750 that we're requiring. Right, exactly. We find that all the time. Okay. So now I think we can, uh, we can return back to um, after a person has transitioned to board certification, uh, which was originally rolled out in 2013. Uh, we are now starting the renewal cycle. And um, after you have all become board certified and are proud of the, to be a board certified massage therapist, um, we will be uh, then requiring 24 hours of continuing education, which is consistent in hours in what we did in the past. And after a lot of dialogue and debate, um, we did feel that we should really be sure that every board certified massage therapist has at least three hours of ethics training in every two year cycle. And then what's new here in terms of our requirements are the three, three CEs of research. And on the research front, we collaborated with the Massage Therapy Foundation to really look at research literacy and determine that we have a responsibility to support as well as encourage massage therapists to become more research literate. The research is something not required for the initial board certification, but it is a requirement for the renewal. And there are a number of different ways 
of gaining those research hours by writing a case report, reading research, an article, and some things that we will return back to a little bit later. And then uh, finally, we also know as healthcare professionals that we do do a lot for self-care. And we wanted to acknowledge some portion of that towards the 24 hours. So we dedicated four hours where a person can use those self-care hours as part of their continuing education. So that covers the 24 hours of continuing education. And, and then, then oh, no, I was just going to say, and then um, how did we come across 100 hours of work experience? Well, that also, in the same way, parallels our previous requirements. And for the 100 hours of work experience, we want to make sure that a person who's board certified in therapeutic massage and body work is continuing to contribute to the profession. So they can do that through hands-on work, volunteering, teaching, and administration. And that's another very common question. Um, and it's another area that if uh, anybody listening is really not sure if your activity uh, would be able to count for these 100 hours, then you can contact NCB and all our contact information is at the end of this presentation uh, if there are any concerns of any kind. There are a couple of other things I'd like to mention. We also added the requirement to maintain current CPR and again pass the criminal background check. Those two elements are common to the initial transition to board certification and the renewal, just like the transition, the board certification, we kept it at a very affordable uh, rate. We also have an $85 uh, renewal fee, so that will be two years later. Right, and you know, I just, I want to um, bring up again that once somebody transitions into board certification, they pay the $85. And then they don't have to renew for two years because we've had several people misunderstand this and they've transitioned into board certification and then they've completed the renewal application within a week and they've paid the $85 again. It's only once every two years. Absolutely. All right. So let's move on to um, why you should tr um, transition into board certification. So the benefits of board certification, um, each one of the people that are listening can identify with one of these areas. Each person listening and each massage therapy or massage therapist deserves recognition for their work. They deserve increased credibility and opportunities for increased earnings. You know, with board certification, together we will obtain higher standards and increase credibility as a profession with board certification. So don't cut yourself short. Board certification and certification in general is the way that other professions have, have raised their standards, and massage therapy is absolutely no different. All right. So let's move in to the pre-submitted questions. Um, while we're doing the pre-submitted questions, please feel free to submit any questions you have during this time. We are here to answer everything. We um, ensured that our presentation wasn't too long so that we couldn't accept all of the pre-submitted questions. Now, if we get 2,000, we might have to collect them all and then put them up on our website within the near future. But please feel free to submit anything you have um, that you don't understand. So here's our first question from Lewis S. How long does it take to process the application? What is the best number to call to ask questions? Would you like to well, take that one, Donna? I would absolutely love to. 
So the actual application process takes approximately two weeks from the time that you submit the um, transition application and all of your documentation. There are two separate forms that you have to complete. Once you submit that, we send out um, the background check. And once we receive that and we've reviewed all of your qualifications, then we approve your application and your certification is created and sent to your home. So the actual application process takes approximately two weeks. And I like to say from mailing your certificate, depending on where in the U.S. it's going, to the time it reaches your house, I like to give two weeks because I don't want anybody waiting around. So I would say give it at least four weeks. And then the number to call to um, ask questions is 1-800-296-0664. You can also email us at info.ncbtmb. Dot org, and all of this information will be on our last page. All right. Donna, would you like to would you like to just repeat the number? I know it's coming up later in the PowerPoint, but just for those who are listening, so they can note it down. Sure. Um, it's one eight hundred two nine six zero six six four. Great. Okay. So. The next question comes in from Karen W. And Lena, I'm going to leave this question to you. What exactly does the research requirement for, for renewal consist of? That's actually such a great question. And as I was mentioning before, the purpose of having the research requirement was to support massage therapists becoming more familiar with research literacy, and there are a lot of different ways to meet this requirement. It can be going to a conference, um, that can be a massage therapy conference or any research conference. We've really tried to make it as broad as possible because just like other professions, when you have a research base and you can discuss research findings with clients as well as allied health professionals and other healthcare providers, it adds credibility to what we know is working. But the more that we can validate it in a scientific way, um, the more relevant it becomes. And there are other ways of meeting the research requirement in terms of writing a case report, writing an article, reviewing an article. Basically, whatever activity relates to research that can be verified and validated in some way, we're willing to accept as the research requirement. And that's something, another thing, that we work very closely with the Massage Therapy Foundation to get their input and, um, of course, their support in our promotion of research literacy. So when a massage therapist and when those of you listening either attend a conference or gain more information about research, you can then discuss it with your clients who are always very interested to know. For example, Duke recently uh, did a study on the effects of massage therapy on osteoarthritis of the knee, but there are many other studies that can enable clients to get more of a research understanding of the effects of massage therapy that they already know anecdotally helps them. And then in terms of talking with others from other professions, it also enables us to be on par with models of excellence that we're already familiar with. Right. And, you know, I, okay, Lena, so I have to admit I'm a little bit of a Facebook junkie once in a while. And um, I watch on different um, leads people talking about what works and what doesn't work. And people referring to, well, you know, I've done research on this and it does work. I've done research on this and it doesn't work. And as in reading the strings of information, I find that people make a decision on something and then they find research that backs their decision rather than finding research on all information and coming, letting the research bring oxygen. So I think one of the more um, important things in our profession learning how to do adequate and accurate research is to learn that you may have a feeling about something 
and you may be able to prove your point with other literature that's written out there, but you have to do a complete research project and look at the full um, evolution of the information, negative and positive, to come up with a real um, accurate final point. So I just want to make sure um, the massage therapy profession understands that we didn't do this just to add a requirement. We did this to help lead our profession into excellence. Yeah, and it's very interesting with research, actually, because sometimes um, even disproving a hypothesis still advances a profession. I personally researched driving and back pain and had nine different groups um, who were conducting, um, you know, who, who were driving and we conducted a study. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting that the group we thought that would respond to the research was actually um, a very different one. So, you know, when analyzing the research, that's just as important as uh, constructing the research. So we're hoping really with this requirement that it will inspire massage therapists to get more involved more familiar and really be able to discuss what is so very great about our profession and the work that we all do. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. So I see another question here from Joe S. I took the NCTMB licensure exam, but never converted into national certification. Can I transition to board certification? I think that's a great one for you, Donna. Yes. Um, unfortunately, Joe S., you cannot transition into board certification. Um, when you took the national certification exam um, only for licensure, you had never met our minimal requirements. So that test was just used as entry-level licensure. You will have to um, take the board certification and meet those minimal requirements to actually become board certified. And if anybody out there has any questions on which test they've taken or um, where they are in their board certification, please feel free to call us. We are here to answer your questions or email us, of course. Okay, our next question is for you, Lena. I have an associate's degree in medical massage therapy, but work part-time about six hours a week. Can I still become board certified? This is by Elma. Well, first of all, Elma, congratulations in having an associate's degree in medical massage therapy. That's a, a huge accomplishment in itself. And the short answer to this question is yes. Um, the, the same requirements apply that we discussed at the beginning of this webinar, that as long as you can demonstrate 750 hours of education and 250 hours of hands-on experience, then you certainly can and are eligible to be board certified. So that was an easy one, Donna. That was absolutely easy. Let's look at our next question from Margaret S. What happens if you do not transition by your renewal date? If my state does not require certification, am I okay? And what if I move? There are really three parts to that one, Donna. There really are three parts. So we'll take the first one. What happens if you do not transition by your renewal date? Well, like we talked about before, we do have um, a lapse period. And I need you, I need anybody out there listening to either email or call in um, to find out what their status is. Because if you're still in your lapse period, then we will definitely work with you to get you into board certification. If you have expired out completely, then you will have to take the board certification examination. And I, I wouldn't fret taking the board certification examination. It was created, built for the massage therapists that are actually working in our profession. It's more assessment based. It's real world scenarios. So don't worry about it. And we do have an online practice exam to help you if needed. Second question. If my state does not require certification, am I okay? Well, as we talked about in previous webinars, 
entry level state licensure is different than voluntary higher um, board certification credentials. So your state requires that you hold an entry level massage therapy license. That credential um, is obtained and the requirements are written by your state. You'll have to take an entry level state licensure exam and then meet your state requirements. Board certification is NCB TMB's um, credential. So you would have to take the board certification credential or meet the board certification requirements to obtain that credential. And if you're currently nationally certified, you can just transition right into the board certification credential. What if you move? Well, if you move, you're going to have to check with the state that you're moving to. You'll have to look into their minimal requirements and meet those. Previously taken a nationally or a national certification exam with NCB, many states will accept that as proof of your um, testing. And so you can contact us. And if you need us to send past results to a state, we can do that. But then you would have to meet that state's minimal entry level requirement. Okay, let's move on oh, to the well next question. Done. Oh, well done, oh, Donna. That was, a, that, that was a long one. So the next uh, question um, is for you, Lena. Um, okay, I have, I'm ready. <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> okay, yes, I've, obtained ready. My, <laughs> I've obtained my national certification through the portfolio review process. Now I know why you're ready, Lena. How would I make the transition to board certification? I will admit I had a little sneak peek there on the question, and uh, the reason why I really want to talk about this one, and thank you for the question, Helen, is because um, I went through the portfolio review process as well. And when you go through the portfolio review process, you then become nationally certified. Once you're nationally certified, all the same requirements apply in terms of the 250 hours of education and uh, the hands-on experience as well as the 750 hours that we discussed, the CPR, the background check. But really the only area that I found in my transition to board certification that would be different because of the portfolio review process is in the transcript. Some of us who originally used portfolio review in order to be nationally certified may have pulled the education from various colleges and various um, trainings in order to meet the requirement. So in the transcript part, you can attach those transcripts and also maybe a note to show um, how were those hours gained from those various areas. Other than that, the process is exactly the same as with anybody else who's nationally certified. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. So, the next question from Susan L. Do I have to become board certified to renew my NCB TMB license? Um, well, those are two separate credentials, and we, um, I think we touched on those. You know, a licensure means you have the entry-level requirements to practice legally within your state, and then board certification is a higher voluntary credential. So certification and licensure are completely separate. You have to meet your state's requirements to practice in the state, and, um, you have to meet the minimal requirements for NCB's board certification to transition into board certification. All right. Okay. Now, you know, um, I know there's always a lot of confusion about that, and I often hear people saying, "Oh, I'm certified in, uh, you know, I'm licensed uh, in a particular state," when they actually mean they're certified or they're certified, but they use that with the licensure. So I think it's really important, and you did a great job there clarifying that these are two very separate and distinct uh, credentials. Well, thank you. Um, I think we have to um, move on. We have several live questions that I would like to get to. 
So, Lena, um, I'm going to read the questions off, and then we'll both answer them. As you know, you can you can work start off, and then I'll just add in if there's anything. You don't often forget anything, but if I need to say anything, <laughs> I'll add in. <laughs> okay. So the first question is. Um, when I graduated, my school was certified. I'm not certain when it happened, but my school is no longer certified. What happens if my school wasn't certified during 2013? And you know what, Lena? I think I'm going to take this one because we get this question a lot within the office. Yes, and feel I want free to, make to sure. Donna. Yeah, let's clarify this. So in 2012, we said that um, anybody who graduated from a school in good standing with NCD TMB, um, their students could move into or could transition into board certification by submitting all of their requirements. And any school that wasn't in good standings would have to um, um, provide additional information. In good standings does not mean that if your school closed, we wouldn't um, allow you to transition or if your school expired because maybe they don't offer the massage therapy program any longer, but they still offer other programs. So if your school closed prior to 2012 or even prior to today's date, and it was in good standing up until that time, you can still transition very easily. Um, if your school's assigned school code um, expired in 2012 or you know prior to this date, you can still um, transition into board certification. That's not a problem. Okay. Let's go on to the next question. Um, once I get board certified in 2015, welcome, um, can I start earning CEs for the 2018 renewal? Was that 2015 that you said there, Donna? Yes, 2015 and then 2018 renewal. So that would actually be, wouldn't that be a 2017 renewal? Yes, I believe so. It definitely would. Okay. So the first point I'd like to make is just to be sure to all of you that are listening that the board certification is a two-year cycle. And um, could you read the question again, please, Donna? Um, Maureen wants to know if she can start earning CEs for that next renewal right away. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, I mean, uh, that's really the answer. Yes, you can start earning CEs straight away. So I don't think we can really elaborate on that one. No. Um, will board certification help me get licensed in my state? So does board certification well, help anyone get licensed in their state at this point in time? Well, the, this is exactly where that confusion comes in between what's licensure and um, what's board certification. Now, in order to meet the board certification requirement, if the state level requirements are less than that, which in some states there are, I'm licensed in three states myself, all of which have um, uh, lesser hours and requirements than the board certification, then all those hours and the experience that an individual might be submitting a board certification would exceed licensing requirements, but it really depends on the state that we're talking about because there may be some states that uh, require a thousand hours, in which case that might not be true. So in this question, it would be nice to know what state we were really talking about. Um, I don't know, Donna, if you can add a little bit more on that one. Well, we do want to make sure that everybody follows their state light, um, regulations and requirements. So I would suggest that anybody out there that wants to know what their state requirements are, that they actually go to their state board and look at them. Some states have it exactly spelled out um, that they, the um, applicants have to take the MBLEX. Um, in fact, many do. So I really want to encourage people to look back at their own states. Okay. That sounds great. Um, so, if I am already nationally certified, do you need my transcripts again? Because NCV should have them on file. Um, Elizabeth's school has since closed, so she's not sure how to get another copy of her transcripts. 
And so let me take this one because we work with this a lot in the office. Go um, right ahead. So you, we may ask you for your transcripts again. If so, um, your school should have sent them to your state. There should be a repository within your state where um, they keep all of your transcripts. If we have them on file, we will look for them. Um, NCB did move from Virginia to Chicago in 2007. In that move, there was information that was shredded and not brought over for um, to keep everything um, confidential. And so we may not have your transcripts, but please call in or email. And if we need to help you find them, we will. We work with a lot of people getting their transcripts from the state. Okay. Yeah, and um, actually, Donna, oh, that happened in Pennsylvania. I was the dean of a, a massage therapy program, and unfortunately, uh, the corporation decided to close the school. We had several hundred graduates during the um, five or six years that we were operating, and they're all held by the state of Pennsylvania. So. Um, there's always going to be a way to be able to uh, get a transcript or some kind of verification of graduation. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, Maureen states, I just want to applaud you for your strong stance against human trafficking. What specifically are you doing in this area? Okay, well, I think that might be, we can both take that one, but Donna, you might want to share just um, over the last few days where you've been. Um, I did just attend a human trafficking conference and found it extremely interesting. The subject probably um, isn't for everyone, though it does involve everyone across the United States. To give a little bit of background of what I learned quickly, um, is that human trafficking is the number two crime in the United States now, and it's closely coming up to number one. And it's, um, it's pretty large in the United States. I know we don't want to bring it into or associate it with massage therapy, but it's really not up to us because the people who are trafficking um, women, men, children, everybody are bringing it into massage therapy. So what we're doing is we're educating on our, ourselves about the situation and what we can do to get more involved and to help our profession. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to ask massage therapists to go out there with bats or anything like that and beat off the human traffickers because that's not safe. We just want awareness. So if you see something happening, you know how to report it, you know where to report it, and you know what to do. Um, Homeland Security is extremely, extremely interested in what's going on. They see this huge problem and they're trying to cut it out of our United States. Um, Thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Donna. So I think, you know, what we can do is we can do something in terms of uh, on the awareness front um, through NCB. But um, it, it's an incredibly huge problem that I think we we don't all even know the true reality of it. And I know that attending the Human Trafficking Conference was very eye-opening in itself. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. If you um, can... I want to say stomach the information, I would highly suggest you go just to educate yourself. Okay, let's move on to a happier point for now. Okay. Um, can I use an online CPR certification? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it all depends um, if it's the first time CPR, then really CPR is one of those things I look at it like learning to drive a car. It's really about the question of, can you learn to drive a car by reading a book? Can you learn to drive a car by taking an online course? Administering CBR is a very sort of physical and mentally draining situation. So it's really, for the first time course, something that an individual really should do face-to-face uh, -face with the instructor. And then I know that there are a lot of online options and opportunities to maintain that. 
So I think that is really the safest pathway to take in terms of the CPR certification. I would even take it one step further and say to make sure that you take it a couple times in person. Because even as um, a CPR trainer and instructor, it was always good for me to be in the classroom going through the process, ensuring that I was comfortable with the skills. And, you know, I, I personally have taken CPR online one time, but it's only because I've taught it for, I taught it for five and a half years. Yeah. Okay. And, and, you know, it's for those of us who have administered CPR, I know it's very easy to take online course and I know everybody's very pressed for time, but when you're right there with the person who requires CPR, it's a blessing that you took mm -hmm. CPR in person. Um, and uh, But, of course, it's a choice at the same time. Yes. Well, you know what, Lena? I think we're out of time. We have probably, I want to say, 100 questions. So what I would like wow. to do is personally take all of these questions, you and I, um, answer them all and put them up on our website so um, everybody who looks at them or, or everybody in the United States can see them um, after the webinar. What do you think about that? I think that sounds fantastic and you know it's so um, it's so rewarding to simply hear that we have so many hundreds of people listening to this webinar. It really shows uh, the level of interest there is to transition to board certification and that we have so many follow-up questions uh, really shows that board certification is uh, gaining its rightful place within the profession to advance us all to have more career opportunities in the future. Well, I am going to keep my board certification because it means that I have a higher voluntary credential and I will keep it for the rest of my life. Um, Absolutely. Okay. And I know you will too because you keep every higher credential you have also. I do. I'm a, great, I'm a great believer in holding the highest credential in every profession because of many of the things that we said. It truly demonstrates a higher level of skills and competencies in our practice and gives us a talking point whether we want to work in hospitals, medical centers, as I do, or other environments that value excellence, as you were mentioning before, Donna. Absolutely. Okay, so for today's webinar playback, um, a full playback will be available tomorrow, June 3rd, um, at the following links www.ncbtmb.org slash webinars or www.ncbtmb.org slash blog. Um, you can also contact NCB. We are always happy to connect with you. Customer support is available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Or you can email us at info dot ncbtmb.org or call us at 1-800-296-0664. Thank you for participating. Thank you for all of your questions. Thank you, Lena, for um, doing this webinar together. I really appreciate you on these. I think we clarified a lot of questions and I think we have a lot more to go through within the next couple of days. Thanks, Donna, for all your time and all your insight as well.